Welcome everyone. just was like i'm out we just lost you he yeah. was like i'm out Quiet. of here she pulled the batman <laughs> i got hosted then she left you Hi, there Kim. Wait, what? Hi. was that kim yeah what's up girl are you sick no, I'm just a little quiet. <laughs> it's the middle of the up. night there, right? <laughs> it is, yeah. Yeah. No good. Yeah, yeah do this again, aren't we? <laughs> Come on, Kim. Tonya's not here. You've got to take over. Hmm? You've got to take over. Tonya's not here. It's your job. You've got to take over. Help us with bubble. Hello. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but we're apparently live and uh, recording, so I will just start from here. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, welcome to Co-Creative No Codes Office Hours, episode number 111. I'm Tanya, your host. We're here with our members, Jay, Thomas, and Callum, and my Kim, as usual. And if this is your first time tuning in to Co-Creative No Codes Office Hours, we do this every day of the week, Monday through Friday, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 10 a.m. Pacific time, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And what it is, is we hop on Zoom and broadcast live to Facebook. Book, and then later we put the recording up on YouTube and essentially all of our members are welcome to bring their bubble questions, any bugs, feature requests, or anything related to bubble to office hours and we discuss them. We don't promise you answers. We do promise that you won't suffer alone and we have a lot of fun doing it. So we'll go ahead and get started, but if you happen to be watching this live, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and push the like button and then uh, same on YouTube and remember to subscribe and get those notifications, all that jazz. All right, we'll go ahead and get started with Jay. Jay, you want to give it, give us a rundown of what you're needing? And so I'll stop I'm looking sharing. into searches. I've got that flower finder thing. I want to do more with searching on my site and I want to do it with more than filters because they're not really working that great for me because my data types are so connected. So you can't start, you, know, you can't search the, you know, another data type through the one that you're trying to search. It, I, that didn't come out right at all, but you know, so okay. like I have a Steve. type. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I've been looking into searches and uh, I've looked into Mealy search, which I posted on Facebook about. It doesn't seem like, like a lot of bubblers are using it. I think I learned about it through you, Thomas. I think that's the first time I heard of it. But I looked at their documentation, which is really good. And I also watched some YouTube videos with their, um, uh, I don't know what her title is, but she, her name's Carolina and she does DevOps outreach. So they have a lot of great stuff. It looks perfect. It's open source. It's powerful. It's fast. But I'm not clear. I, I was able to set up uh, a Mealy search server on AWS. It was very yeah. easy because the documentation was excellent. But I haven't been able to understand how to move to the next step, which is web scraping, so I can scrape my um, data types. So that's my general issue. But so while I was at it, I also looked into alternatives, you know, um, like Algolia. Well, I'm on the first level of paying plan. I don't know what it's called. Personal plan, maybe. Mm -hmm. And it looks like Algolia, you've got to be on the professional plan. Well, fortunately for you, we have a professional plan to find out. Good. And then also when I was in, I looked in plugins and there's two plugins. One is from zero code and the other, I can't remember, maybe anti-code. I can't remember. They offer Algolia plugins. And I'm wondering if those plugins work with a lower level plan. I don't know any of the answers to any of your questions so far, okay. Jay. <laughs> So, trying to keep you uh, keep we're on the it together. <laughs> gotcha. So, no code, is, no code is on the professional plan. So, and the way that Algolia, like that I've seen Algolia work, is actually from the privacy rules. So, like if I went to my looms here, um, 
when you have it, like maybe I'll do this, go into the search here, general, looking for something, enable searching with Algolia. Um, I did that in, oh, there you are. That's where I did it. Okay. Or that's where I tried to do it. Um, right. Down below the, yeah, there you go. And then did, do you have this in, no. in your app? Well, no, you no. don't have it? Well, when I click okay, on enable with personal. Algolia, I get the um, please upgrade to use this function method. Got it. Okay. So I would need an Algolia application search API and admin key. Okay. So let's do it. Let's go to... Well, I mean, I know that works, but the question I have then is, I wonder if the plugin that Zero Code and the other uh, developer are offering, I wonder if those work on a lower level plan. There's a really good uh, video about how to set up Algolia by Million Labs. Mm -hmm. um, so I've looked at that. It looks super simple, but it's $100 yeah, more a month. You'd have, you'd, you'd, you would have to ask Zero Code. Yeah. I have no idea if, if, if they will work on a lower plan or not. I assume so. I assume if you're, if you're paying, you mean the, the lower plan of bubble, right? Yeah. Yeah. So unless I say so in their, in their documentation, I mean, we can, I can download it. Let me go back to the sandbox. There was also another one, another plugin uh, called, I'll find it in a minute. Um, and it was connected, it looked really good. It was, uh, except that although the plugin's free and it would work on my plan, it looked like to do a custom search, which is a search of your own content, not the web, that the pricing was for less than a hundred searches a day, it was free, but for, more than that, it was $850 a month. I was like, okay. can we have no middle ground? <laughs> I hate those ones. I had the same thing with the news API, where it was like, you get up to a certain number of API calls, where it was like $1,500 a month. I was like, just give me like a $20 a month one that lets you add some more, rather than either make it stupidly expensive or you can't use it. Right, let you grow <laughs> into it. No, they want their money. Okay, so... This is the one you were talking about, or this one? I look, yeah, uh, I was, I looked at both. Um, I looked at both. I, you know, I figured zero code, you know, zero code is going to be there to su support it. It's more expensive, but they exist. You know, I don't know the other person, you know, 24 apps versus 3,000 apps. Got it. Uh oh. Usually it tells me that it's free. <laughs> Let's see here. Just double checking. Yeah, I'm on the agency plan, so it should be fine. Okay, so installed it. And then I need all of the, I still need all of these API keys and codes and stuff, but I don't see why it wouldn't work to be honest with you. It doesn't oh, say that it doesn't say you had like generally the plugins don't care which which bubble app you're on. The only thing is if if they don't if bubble wouldn't allow it, <laughs> but I don't see why bubble wouldn't allow it. So not sure. I mean, well, I don't understand why it's this plugin would exist because if, if that wasn't the case, because Bubble makes it pretty easy to connect to Algolia, like through Bubble. You don't really necessarily need a, I don't know why you would need a plugin. It looks like you just click a bunch of stuff, put in your keys and boom, you've got Algolia search without a plugin. So I'm wondering if that's the purpose of this plugin. I would just oh, ask you know, Zero um, Code, just ask them that yeah. that's the, the, easiest, fastest way to get an answer is to say, hey, do I need to upgrade my bubble plan from personal to professional in order to use 
your um, Algolia plugin. That's right. Are we asking if you need to be on a higher plan to be able to use Algolia? Yes. Do you, do do you use? You, yeah. No. You, you can't use it on the basic plan, can you? On the, on no, the no, no. She's talking the native. So there's a difference. There's Bubbles native Algolia search support. And then the, there are these plugins that ostensibly do the same thing for you. So the question, the question is, does she have to upgrade her account to the professional plan to use this plugin? I say there's nothing here that I see that says that you do. And, but the only way to really know is to ask the plugin author. Yeah. That, was that a free plugin or a paid one? No, it's paid. I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like the, the bubble did the partnership with Algolia, which is why it's built into bubbles. So they're not going to let you get around it by going to a, a third party plugin. Well, I think that's it. Jay's yeah. concern. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's but it would be weird that that zero code doesn't say right up front. Don't do like don't buy this plugin because they're not refundable if you pay for it once. Yeah. Have we gone to demo and documentation though, because it might say in that. Because I, I don't know. I feel like maybe the Algolia search BT one might be one of their courses, and they'll they'll get you to use the plugin rather than doing it through Bubble. Because you're right. Why would they build another uh, a plugin for something if it doesn't? Yeah, you know, if 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 it, if it already exists in Bubble. Um, Yeah, I still think you have to ask. I mean, yeah. I would just, instead of assuming, I would just ask. So they might say, no, of course not. You don't need it because you, you know, once you're on the personal plan, you can send information through APIs and stuff, right? They don't limit your API calls on the personal plan that I know of. So it should, should be fine. So just ask zero code. Um, I got lost in all of your questions, Jay. It's just all questions about search, you know? <laughs> Everything's about search. Well, Miley's search I can't help you with because I have no idea about setting up AWS and web scraping and all of that fun stuff. So um, that one sounds like we need like some professional documentation. Well, I Maybe reached I can... out to Cameron. And I'm meeting with him at four o'clock today. I'm going to see what he says. The other person sent me a link to their Fiverr page, which I'd already seen because when you Google Miley search and bubble, that's what comes up. He's got the only spot. <laughs> got it. But I don't like paying. Um, I don't mind paying. I don't like paying for someone to do something for me that I don't understand. Because then if it breaks or you want to scale or if and that person has moved on in their life, they're not doing it then you've got something broken. You've got to start from scratch. I'd like to at least have a better understanding of how it works um, so I can fix it myself or at least get started or know what to ask if mm -hmm. it does break or need to scale. So you're meeting with, with Cameron? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, I actually just reached out to the guy that responded to you on your thread and I asked him for if, if, he, if he knew of any clear instructions on how to implement my research on bubble or if you knew anybody else so i'll probably reach out to the other guy too just kind of craft my message in a way where you know probably yeah ask if he wants to come and present himself what you were mentioning earlier was a pretty interesting idea too yeah so we'll see i'll have to reach back out to andrew about that and see how it goes but that could be an interesting way to move forward. All right. Any were there any other specific questions, Jay? No. No. Okay. Thomas, did you have anything for today? Yes, I do. What's up? What's do you up? want to share your screen? Give me one second. Okay. Uh, it seems like Jay's sharing, maybe someone's sharing right now. I am. I'll stop sharing. I was just waiting for you to be ready. Oh, I got a response from Miley Search in my in my post about help in the bubble forum on bubble.io. Yeah, I, I messaged that guy, Ferdinand, for clearer instructions, essentially. 
so it's interesting that they're paying attention, that they're on the bubble forums. I noticed he actually joined a few hours before. He must have gotten an alert. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It seems like they're starting to pay attention because when I reach out to customer service, they're like, damn, unfortunately, well, they didn't say damn, but they said, unfortunately, we, we can't, we don't have any instructions on that, but it would be a cool addition. Um, okay. Awesome. This looks great, Thomas. Thank you. So I think I managed to figure out how to, no, I did manage to figure out how to do it. It's taking a little longer than I should. Give me a second. Okay, I haven't, all right, I'm gonna just start from the beginning. So to give you some clarity here. So what I did this weekend was, you see how it deleted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just figured out how to delete it. And the first question I will ask is I just wanted to know whether or not there was a faster way of doing it as in regards to like once it deletes the canvas and the canvas answers. Um, gotcha. Cause it's a little slow. It's still like eight, seven, it's, it creates faster, but when it leads, it's pretty slow. Yeah. So the, what I would recommend in that case is no, there's no, there's not really a faster way to lead it. Gotcha. Um, but what you, what you can do is, the loading make it so that the um that the constraint on your page that has it showing up because it exists is actually not it exists but whether or not it's active or inactive and make it inactive and then delete it because mm -hmm. when it's inactive it'll disappear from the repeating group so from your user's perspective it's deleted and then you can delete it on the on the back end so they don't it doesn't interrupt them at all. So I kind of lost you along the way there. I think I have to Okay. So that. your your question is is I is you were showing us the page. Go back to the page. I know there's nothing there right now. So add a new canvas and then go back before it's done. So So you cancel. So it's deleting, right? Yep. And it takes a while to delete and then it's still there and then it's gonna disappear once everything's deleted. So what I'm saying is that another constraint, go, go to that repeating group in your editor. Uh, the repeating group in the index page. Yep, so search for Canvas, click where it says Search for Canvas. Okay, so the owner equals current user and then add a constraint where it says active equals yes or something. So you can add a new field straight from there. If you just click where it says click, scroll down to the bottom. Oh, oh I guess you can't add it from there. I thought you could. Would I, I be adding a new field or a new data? Yep, a new field. Under Canvas? Yep, canvas. canvas and then under Canvas and it would be active. It's a yes, no type. Mm -hmm. And then field type, yes, no. And then you can, nope, just say create. Okay, so now when you create a canvas at the point that you want it to show in that repeating group, you set it to active. So it would be default no. So go ahead and click and make it yes equals yes. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. And then if you don't want to automatically make it active, you don't have to. And then when it's um, like, at what point do you want it to be, to show up there? Like you have to decide that if you want it to automatically be active, you can do it when you create it. I'm trying to understand the point of this in general. So is this, does active mean like, can you just clarify what that means? Sorry. In I'm, I'm, I'm losing you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. There's no faster way to delete stuff from the bubble database. It's going to take time, gotcha. right? So you were wondering how can I make this faster? Cause it takes a while for that tile to disappear after you delete the canvas. That's because it still exists until it doesn't, right? Yep. The way that you make it disappear faster is by setting an active field to yes or no, because you can change that to no instantly and it will disappear from that repeating group, even though it's still taking time to delete. Gotcha. So it's there, but it's hiding. It's there, but it's hidden. Yeah. 
in this active? By default, it's yes. And I'd want to switch it to no. Nope. So, that so that's not where you set the, the default to yes. This is where you're setting it to only show canvases that are active set to yes. Yeah, it's okay. I see what you mean. Yeah. So now when you either create the canvas or, um, yeah, I guess when you create the canvas, you'll set it to equal yes to active. And then on that cancel button, the first thing you do will set it to no. Uh, it's because I'm actually doing this in the back end workflow. I'm both deleting. I would do it on the page because I tried that'll... to do that, but I couldn't quite figure that out. Okay. No, no, not the deleting part. The deleting part I agree with on the back end workflows. But I would in that on that cancel button, the first thing I would do would be make changes to that thing. So add an action. There you go. Make changes to a thing. And the thing you're going to change is the canvas. So it's probably parent groups canvas. And then act the change another field. And then active equals no. Okay. So this is where it does it. Okay. Yep. And then now you have to make sure that when you first create the canvas, you set that active to equal yes. So I guess it's add new canvas. Is that button add canvas? I just want to make sure that I want. Yep. So create a new canvas. Why is this not working right now? What's not working? Oh, it's not pulling up the. This is what you mean. Okay. Yep. There you go. So that should work. Okay. So try it again. I still have to tie those, those loading screens to the to an actual okay. custom state. I haven't done that. I've just been trying to time it through through an add a pause action. If that makes sense. Gotcha. That's amazing. So now comes my second question. And thank you, by the way, for that. I appreciate You're that. You're welcome. Of course. My second question, unless somebody else has another question. Is that how you spell uh, canvases? What was that? I'm trying to work out how you spell canvases. Can I know. I did the same thing. This isn't, this doesn't look like it's spelled right, is it? I, th I think it's canvas and then apostrophe S. Canvases. No, no. no. I'm no, no, wrong. it's it's, it's spelled spell it? correctly. Correct. He's got it right. <laughs> right. Some, someone just it you're, you're right. You're grammar you're offending teacher. the professional. Yeah, you're 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 offending the professional here. I'm is horrified. That horrified. Is that how it's spelled? It yes. Looks, it doesn't look right. <laughs> no, it's canvas i c a n v s i i. Canvas i. She's teasing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jay. <laughs> so upset. <laughs> Sorry, it's the second it's chapter it's... of your grammar book. The second chapter. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it's really difficult. It's funny. It, it, my daughter is suffering the same way that I suffered. She's second guessing herself in her language arts classes. And I think the cure is actually to study a foreign language because when you study a foreign language, then the parts and the, like the way that the, your native language, like makes sense, like the different pieces of it are, start to like form a clearer picture as opposed to intuition all the time. I think so the best way to learn it is to teach it. it all you have to do is stay a chapter ahead of everybody else and you're good yeah. to go. Grammar is not complicated. There's just a lot of it, but you mm -hmm. only need the first three or four chapters of the grammar book. The rest of it, you don't need. Yeah. If you just read a lot, you end up figuring out how to yeah. see most of it. Yep. So let me just jump right in here. I think, um, hang on just a second. Sure. 
I do have a question from Callum. He sent it to oh, no, me. It's fine. It's fine. Thomas, you go first. You go no? First. Okay. All right. Thomas, you're good. <laughs> sure. Yep. I'm sure. I just I'm wanted just to check to spell in. Over here. <laughs> He's focusing on his spelling. Gotcha. <laughs> you want to share your screen again? Okay. Perfect. Sure. I'll just show you what I did again. I'm just going to do this. Give me a second. So I'm creating the thing for the canvas. Mm -hmm. And you know, how, how would you like to work on your canvas, a blank canvas, and it would lead you to a blank canvas? Mm -hmm. It skips all the steps ahead and you can edit these things. Now I'm having a bit of trouble. I managed to obviously delete on the first page on that cancel button. Okay. Step. I'm having a bit of trouble canceling it on this page. Um, okay. And I don't know whether or not, like I try so to follow the link between the parent child elements and it seemed like everything was done properly. Okay. But it's well, go to the workflow that's on that uh, trash can icon. Yeah. I don't know why Bubble is doing this. Uh, it's okay. So just... go open that um, workflow in the back end. So it's got the campus answers. Yeah, the, you just had the wrong one. You should have it as cancel canvas rather than canvas answers because you're creating oh, damn, a new canvas. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> I do stuff like that all the time. So do I. <laughs> that's why I'm good at debugging it. <laughs> I love how like when I figured out the answer, I don't know what I'm doing. I just start smashing everything on the page like this. What were we again? Here we are. So I just have to you know, change this. Canvas answers. Oh man, but was like mad about it today. I see. Um, but you're also gonna wanna do the same thing, put the first, um, put the first action as making that canvas inactive by setting active to no. That's right. Is it deleted? Yeah. Yeah, that's right, because we have that inactive now. So it just hides in the back. That's very keen though. That's cool. It literally is like magic, isn't it? It's like a 1,000 pound magic wand. Yeah, wand. Really like if you if you can lift it, then it's magic, right? Let's see. So Reese is joining us, but let's go ahead and Callum is wanting to know covering BDK uploader and how it links with upload care and how you grab the files and save to the database. Kind of. Um, so I was originally asking kind that of. One. I was then thinking, do you want to try and break bubble again? Should we um can I, should, we, should we see if we can get that plug in working and see if it's me being stupid or you know the one that nearly broke my bubble? Um you got like an environment that you could test it in that's not going to screw everything else up. Well, yeah, I can always create an environment to see about that. But yeah, we could try that. Was it, but there's it, not it, a it, specific question. Well, no. So, so the BDK, uh, the BDK one's really good, but the 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 UI part that I hate of it is you have to click on a button to you, you can't click on an element to trigger the upload thing. You have to click on an element to show an element. Then you don't have to click on the the plugins button. The plugin that I was trying that broke my app is the only one I found that you can trigger it by clicking on any element. And it's such a massive difference from a UI perspective, you know, clicking on something once versus clicking on something, and then I have to click on something again, and then find the picture you're uploading, and then click upload again. So if we can get this one working, it negates the need to use the BDK one. The BDK one does have a load of other functionality like cropping and stuff. But the one thing I can't get around is the fact that you have to click multiple times to access it. Got it. 
So we're talking about eliminating extra clicks. You want to be able to do something in one click. Yeah, I, I mean, I can share my screen and show you what I mean by it. So please, uh, that always helps. Uh, Hi, Reese. I saw you came in. No. Mostly because I let you in. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. So this is one life, and we can see recently. Oh, Tonya's posted. Oh, I'm laughing at me about not being able to spell. How lovely. Thank you, Tonya. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you keep up to date with one life, Callum. Well, on my behalf, even. It's awesome. <laughs> anyway, it's like so you're my to... social media manager for one life. <laughs> so when you go to post, um, the, the, what I will, when I click add images and video, I want this to trigger the up uh, the the upload thing where it opens your files up. What I've got at the moment is this one where you have to go here, so it opens that up. Then you have to click here, and then it opens everything up. And then you can select your files. The plugin that I had allowed you to trigger the upload based on clicking this, and obviously you didn't have the slide up thing then because it just opened up the file up thing. Now that's the best way to do it. The BDK one still requires you to have a element on the page. So if I go here, I can do this quite quickly. Uh, if I change the media uploader, hide this on the load. Not this one load, and then go to the BDK one. That one. Um, what's it called again? Um, oh, uploaded BDK. Um, what's it called? Uploaded widget. Okay. Someone shout me for it. Is that the one that broke your app? No, no, no. So this is the BDK one. Okay. Um, the, I'll show you the one that broke my app in a minute. This is the um, BDK one. And it's, it's a really good one because the way it works, um, so if we go back to preview here and then refresh it, this may take a while. I'll just stop sharing my screen so it loads quicker. Yeah, the BDK one is really good because it has all of the, um, it has like filters and cropping, everything like that built in. So, you know, when we were trying to find the croppy thing, mm -hmm. BDK has all that stuff built in. The only issue is, is the, the extra click of it just makes the UI look messy. Um, I have Sorry, a recursive not, workflow not. right now running. I'm Sorry. watching it. I have a recursive workflow running right now and I'm watching it in the background and it's like, it won't be done until it's at 10,000 records. It's at 3,115 going on 60, is that, but it oh. broke in the middle of the night. Ah. No, this is off topic. I'm just okay, sorry. like, I thought you meant that was a bug you found a problem. <laughs> this is this is back to to Tom about the magic wand and like we're doing magic. It's like yeah, you I said it and it just does now, it. Yeah. Yes, we can yeah. see. So when you click on here, you get this weird thing here, which means oh, sorry, yeah. So when you click it, you get that. So you have to click once to get to this, and then once to click on files. And then wants to click to choose from a local part. It's just it's kind of all over the place. Um, I mean the, the uploader itself is fantastic because it does all this, and then you can say click on that and you can you know, do all the editing and you can apply that, you can put effects on it and all that kind of jazz. It's fantastic. The only problem is, is it takes four clicks to get here. Um so yeah, and then that's that's why I kind of don't want to use that one, but the one that broke the app was this one. It's called Test File Selector and Uploader. So we maybe we've got to put it on the index, don't we? Because it will like break it even quicker. So 
this one is the test file one, we'll just put that on the index there. Test file type A, and then write a post with that workflow. Uh, choose files. Yeah, they go to choose the files. The only one is that. Just while it loads. I know I can get this file with it on the page without it break anything. It's when we I tried to save it that it broke stuff. That's the one where I kind of like to test it in a separate sandbox because I'm going to destroy your sandbox as well. Mm -hmm. That was crazy what it did to your app. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for those of you who don't know, I tried to um, I tried to use this plugin and it saved something to the database. I tried to save three images. Thought it'd work and it'd save something to the database, but it'd save something so big that Bubble couldn't load it. And I couldn't delete the record because I couldn't see the database because Bubble couldn't even load, load it in the database view. Um, and then when I did manage to see it, it wouldn't let me delete it for about half an hour because again, Bubble just couldn't handle the size. Um, anyway, here we go. So, well, why right post? And then when we click on here, it automatically triggers that, which is exactly what you want. What I would now like to test is how we get whatever I put in here and save it to the database without. Is that cool? Um, well, I'm sorry, I'm like not following. What's your question to me about it? So, you, oh, you want to try to get this working now without yeah, breaking your app? Okay. Yeah, can we try it in one of your sandbox environments and see if we can get it to save images and video to the database in a normal way? Sure, we can try that. Awesome. What's the name? What's the name of it again? It is called uh, Multi File Selector and right. Upload. Right. I shared too soon. Okay. Let's see here. We're gonna. Can you send it in chat the name of it? Yeah, of course. Oh, uh, do you want the name or the link to it? Uh, the name of it, because that's how I have to search it yeah. in the plugins. Okay. Got it, and we want to. I feel like other people have issues as well because we've got like one point seven stars out of five. Well, yeah, that's people are not liking this one. That's what I mean. It's, it hasn't got like loads of downloads. I'm not sure whether it's just a complicated one to use with very bad instructions, or if it is just a broken plugin. Well, I mean, I would say if it broke your app, it's probably really bad. <laughs> like generally. It could just be really confusing. No, because I, I can remember what I said about the fact that I potentially saved, tried saving the custom state to the database rather than the actual files. And that could have been why. And it could have, it could have, I don't know, they could have been repeatedly trying to save it, which is why it filled it up or something. It, it may be me implementing it badly rather than. Um, okay. Well, let me. So, what, which one is it here? Uh, the element? It will be no down at the bottom, it'll be the input, I think. Um, right at the bottom, yeah. So it's called test file selector and upload. That's I don't right. know why it says test in front of it, but that's the one. Okay. And then two. Push image to state. What does this say?
Well, how else are you supposed to use it? Um, well, so, so if you if you turn, I think it it just stores it within the the plugin itself, and this is awesome. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. It's like it, they have a checkbox here to push the image to state, but it says pushing the image to the element state to be accessed. That's how you access it. Is what's in that state. But they're like, this can cause lag. But how else are you supposed to do it? How are you supposed to get the images to store anywhere? if you can't access them because it's not in the state. This is just like, mm. this is a red flag for me, I guess is what I'm saying. Because if you, so if you turn that off and you have, I mean, tell you what, should we set up the supporting stuff like the repeating group with a image element in it? So that well, we don't really it. need, we don't really, like all we need is we just need a data type for test uploader. Right, and we'll have an image field. Is it images that you're saving? Uh, files. Or files and files? Okay, so files. And file list, here we go. That's all we need to test this, right? And then a button, because yeah, the button is so upload. And this is going to do element uh, so if you type in test, oh yeah, oh sorry, uh, yeah that one, sorry, yes that one. Choose, there we go, and then uh, I guess element test file images are uploaded. Uh, create a new thing, test uploader files set list. So this one here, so it's it's up, it's yeah, upload files or all files, and that's the thing. I don't know how do we trigger the upload. You don't. So this is this is happening. So when they're uploaded, when there is an upload that's happened, it creates a new test uploader, and it sets the list. Right. Awesome. So watch here. Just watch. So I click upload, yeah. I'll just use today's thing. And then now I should be able to go into my app data into test uploaders and it did not kick off that thing. So because that's what I mean, because it, it differentiates between all files and uploaded files, but I didn't see an action to actually trigger the upload. Because it, it, you know, like um, up the uploader where you, you can upload the files, but it only displays them in the plugin, and then you have to actually upload them to Bubble. It should be when you click the button. But no, but when you click the button, you're selecting the files. Okay, so then let's make a new button. That's what I mean. I, I don't know if there's ugly. another button you can do to actually upload the stuff that you saved to it. So we'll call this select yeah. and this upload. And then here. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Files All right. to upload. Oh, sorry. It says here files to upload. Yeah, and then all files, I think. No, it, it will be all files, won't it? Because the all files are the ones that are pending, and then the uploaded ones will be the ones after, I think. Saying this is the person who broke their app doing this, but. I picked the wrong way to do that. There you go. Okay. Didn't screw with yours. All right. Yeah, it looks okay. Yeah, so th that's it's still the, an I extra button. I don't like that, but no, 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 because no, because because uh, it's it's not an extra button because you'll click it and the upload button will only happen when you click to post. And what I'll do is, in order to preview the images, I'll just okay. show you those that are stored. Um, All right. So it is one less button, but I, I see what's happened there. I think I must have tried to store the custom state as something in the database, which is why I didn't like it, and 
it screwed up something because I didn't do the upload bit. I assumed that it would, I would just be able to save the all files directly to my database. But I think you have to have that upload uh, step. Gotcha. So you're going to have a select button and then this would be post. And when you click post, it'll finish up. It'll do the official upload, which will trigger the storing in the database. Kind of either that, or we could you could even remove the second button and just do a when condition is true and um, number of all files is greater than zero. Uh, run the upload. No, because because they're going to be added to, like I'd be careful. I would test that one. I I like your idea of doing it when you click post because that's when you really need to up like finish uploading. Yeah. It, yeah, it's it's. I guess that's the question then, or whether you because if you go because if you do an if you do a a when condition like a do when, and they go back to edit the pictures, it could get complicated. I'm just thinking, yeah, from a UX perspective, because if you do it when you click post, if you have ten pictures and a couple or a couple of videos and a few pictures, that could take a long time to upload and the user just sat there wondering why it hasn't posted. So I'd need some kind of indicator to say it's, uh, it's loading or something or posting, you know, the way Facebook says you're, you're posting upload or whatever, but at least we've got it working. We know it works and it's not, it was my fault. Yeah. Let's just hang on a sec. Let's do, um, going to be in an or file and then And then I guess if it's an image, you could do it this way. What did you set the data source of the um, repeat group to? Files. The file store. Oh. So did you set that to all files? Yeah, all files. So if I ostensibly, so like if I if I go back here and I add another one, no. Nope. So this is why I was like, maybe. So every time I do this, it clears out what was there before. Oh, okay, cool. So, so it's like, so, uh, but that, but what? Can, sorry, can you go back to the editor and just click on that repeat group so I can? Yeah, see. hang on a second. Let me use different pictures. I, I, I get what you mean. It's clearing out, which is which is what you want because you don't want it to. Yeah. Oh, because I said I set the limit to be two. Let me. See set it to be five. So those are the three. And then if I click here and I come down and I say, okay, I wanna add this one, this one, and this one, it changes the mount. Yeah, that's, that's perfect for me though, because when images are shown, it covers up the click to add images videos so you can't add any more you have to remove them all and then add new ones if you want to it's a bit of a shock okay. but, um, but yeah can i can i see what you what what your um, repeating group is sure. the data source on it i assume it's just the it's uh, type of content one. file and then the data source is the the uploaders all files yeah that okay that that was where i made my mistake i when i, I did when you click you know post it took all files from there and saved the database, but they're not actually files, are they? They're just saved as a state at the moment. Okay. And I think that that, that was where my problem was. Okay, right. cool. I'll um, I'll try and re-implement it. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Reese. What do you have for me today? Uh, nothing huge. I just had a simple question. I'd just like to know um, if you're capturing like log file. Uh, let's say every, every time somebody logs in, do you just capture that as a data type as text and make that text a list? 
So you want a list of every time somebody logs in? Yeah. Yeah. I want to capture every time. Somebody I logs would, in. I, I wouldn't do that as a list on a thing. I would do that in individual things of a data type. And the reason is because the list can only contain 10,000 and ostensibly you want lots of people who are addicted to gambling on their games, logging in like 10 <laughs> times a day. <laughs> Ideally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so just to, just to like prepare for success I would do it as I would go into the data type and I would have here like like logs well I've got I've got one called user stats and in that I've got uh, like login um login well date. this is this is going to be different than than like a tally kind of thing so I would say like I would call it something because like your user stats, you're keeping cumulative track of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, if you want to track the number of times or do you like what, what kind of information about the login are you wanting to track? Like the date and time or. Yeah. So all of it, like uh, how, Obviously, if I track each one of these, I'll be able to get more data out of it. But yeah, I want to track uh, when they log in, uh, you know, just basically I'll capture the date and the time. And then from that, I can find out, you know, how often they log in, what time they log in, uh, the average time that they're logged in, stuff like that. Okay. So I would... Um... So essentially, I'm, I'm capturing a date time every time they log in. Right. And I would say that you want to track that in an individual thing and mm -hmm. like an individual data type, like a, like you're tracking a login. But if there are other things you're tracking that way, you could, you could kind of fold them in, but it would be an instance that you're tracking, that you're creating a new thing in the database every time. Yep, and then fine. if you want if you want that to tally up somewhere so that you can show it like in a dashboard, then you'd have to have different workflows with a different data thing mm -hmm. in order to kind of like, in order to create the repeating group that you would want to create to kind of like compare users. So, cause oh, the you thing have, that you- I'm sorry, I want to ask questions. I, I want to do this too. If you, so you'd have a data type, maybe like user activity, but then you said you'd have to tally it up with a different thing. I'm not clear on that. Okay, so I ran into this problem um, with um, with a different app, and so they wanted a they wanted a leaderboard, right, of who was winning their games or whatever. So we've talked about this before. Yes. And and essentially, the problem that I was running into was that the, the things that I were tracking games in this case, um, I could have run all of the math and done it in a repeating group, but bubble would break because I was going to try to do it for 1200 plus users at the same time. Right. And bubble, like if you're doing searches and doing a bunch of calculations and stuff in a repeating group, you, it's, it's just not friendly to bubble bubble's going to get mad at you and it's going to quit so what i did was i tell i started sending information into a separate data type called a tally and i made one tally for each user so it was a one relationship with the users and then i created the buckets of like what i was tracking and then every time a new game was played it got added to all of the different buckets. And then I set the workflows to remove it from the specific buckets at the right time. That way, when I ran, when I did my search on the page, so my repeating group here, it was a very simple search for the tallies. It showed all of the tallies. And then depending on which view I wanted, it would show the different fields. But, it, but all Bubble had to do was load one search and then there was very little like math or filtering or anything in the repeating group itself. So what you're going to want to do when you're, when you're planning for something like this is you want to plan for how can I make it as easy as possible for bubble to show me the information I want shown on the page, because that's, what's going to keep it quick 
and simple. Now, if you're just doing this for your own purposes and you're, you're the admin and you want to see the stats to compare to each other just for your own purposes, maybe a weight is okay, right? So maybe the like effort of, of doing something circuitous in the database to get get it to work faster like maybe you're like well I'll click a button I'll go get a coffee and I'll come back and then it'll be ready as long as it's not going to break bubble but in general I think you know even for your for yourself you're going to want things as fast as possible so you can just get them done and the best way to do that is say okay I'm going to do a search here and I want to like if I was doing a search here I'm going to search for tallies and then whatever my constraint is going to be here. And I want to make that as like, if I make this of type tally, I could just search for tallies, right? This is the simplest search that I could possibly do. I don't have any constraints on it. Nothing is, is going to, you know, all bubble has to do is return these things to me. Um, then here I can constrain it so that like, the user sees what they do. I can also constrain it from the data privacy rules, right? Because if, if I'm only supposed to see things that are related to me, I could search for tallies. And if I have my data privacy rules set up correctly, like here, and say um, owner, and say this tallies creator, is current user, right? And then everyone else can't see anything. Then even if I don't constrain this repeating group, like even if I don't say anything here to constrain it, it will still only show me my tallies, right? Does that make sense? And so yeah. that's like the very simplest, easiest, fastest thing you can do on Bubble. Everything you add to this, like from this point, starts slowing things down a little bit, right? And so the question is, how can you get the information you're looking for with the simplest search data source possible? Yeah. Like, so, um, sorry, back to the uh, the user login part of that. Um, mm -hmm. If I create a data type and attached to the user and within that data type, I capture their login date and time and I put that into the database. They'll never see that on the front end because I'll never show that to them. Um, mm -hmm. But then I mean, on the admin panel in the back end, I could just do a search for this user, their, um, their login uh, date times or whatever, and then do some math and, and compare them or whatever. Yeah, so is that, this is how is you would okay? create this is how you'd connect it to the user. And then yeah. you would say date and it would be of type date here. And that's all you would need. And then when you're trying to search, the question that I would have for you, are you going to be looking at trying to compare this data um, like, in a cumulative manner and trying to compare it to other users? Or are you only gonna look at one user at a time? Uh, no, I probably, yeah, look at them cumulative. Right, and, you're, and, and you don't just want like, because here, if I go, um, so if I have my repeating group, I'm not going to, I'm probably not going to want to search for like, just do a search for all logins. That's not, that's no. going to be meaningless, right? Yeah. So what I'm going to want to do is probably if I'm designing the table, what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want the username, right? And then I'm going to want the um, probably buckets of time, right? Like I'm probably going to want to know how many times they logged in in a bucket with within a bucket of time, right? Yep. Kind of like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, maybe the average per day of logins, the average number of logins per day. 
So that's probably like how I would want to set this up. So I could just do a text here. So we'll say user and then um, number of logins. And average per day. OK. And then I'll probably want a filter. And so probably I can just represent that with a drop down. Oops, I want that outside of the repeating group. Okay, so, and then this is going to, the static choices or whatever, these are going to be my buckets of time. Like you'll probably want to know in the last week, um, the last month, this year and all time or something like that. Yep. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. And then, so for what that means to my data type here, is I'm gonna do, um, so you have the logins that you're keeping track of, and then you're gonna have um, login tally. And then the login tally is gonna have an owner, which is gonna be type user. This is still going to be limited by that 10,000 thing. So you would have to, when we bump up against that, we'd have to fix it. But that would be a good problem to have. So we would say last week. And this would when be. When that breaks, will it just stop accepting new data into that yep. data type? Okay. Yep. It does send you an alert. It's got a. Bubble's got a pre built in one to say you can't save it to the new database. Last month, and then this is going to be what a log. So, this is the way to do big reporting on the back end, I guess. You set up a workflow to calculate all this in, and then you can review it afterwards, right? Right. Right. So, this is how, I mean, yeah, the, the lists are going to be limited to 10,000. Right. So if you have somebody logging in 10,000 in the last week times in the last week or month, there's probably a problem. Like that's probably not a real threat, but over time you hope that in this year or maybe even in like all time, they would hit that number. Yeah. So why would you do it this way instead of um, just doing a count on the login data type? <clears throat> yeah you could do that but it's going to be searching per row that's why so searching maybe if you're you paginating know. like searching per row like ah. if i'm if i'm on here and i'm and i'm like okay this is the user right and i want to know the number of times they logged in within a certain period of time i'm gonna have to do a search for those logins here, mm -hmm. constrained by that, by whatever we chose here. And it's gonna have to do that for every row. So if you have, like, yeah. if you paginate and you only show 10 on the page at a time, you might be okay, but it's, it's still, it's gonna be a lot of searching, right? And it's gonna take up capacity. Whereas uh -huh. doing it in one search is a lot better for your system, so. Um, and it, and this might like, it might, when you get to the point where you need to track that many things for like the dashboard, that might be a good reason to move on to something like backendless that doesn't have that limitation, I don't think, or can at least do the query much faster. So um, let's go back to, where was I? Oh, here. So like last week, last month, this year.
and all time. Okay, so you have all of these lists of logins. So when you create, when the person logs in, you'll create automatically a new login thing. And then you'll add that thing to all of the lists, right? And then you'll schedule uh, three different, uh, well, probably two different workflows. One to remove it from the last week in seven days. Like, mm -hmm. so in, in current date plus seven days, you'll remove it from this list. And then um, the last month in at the end of the month where like if you're if you're keeping track of last 30 days, right? So in 30 days, you would remove that login from this list, right? And then at the end of the year, you can run a recursive workflow to remove all of the logins. So on New Year's Eve to move to clear the list of all tallies for this year's logins. And then all time you wouldn't ever set it because you'd want to keep it in that list. Does that make sense, Reese? Kind of. <laughs> kind of, kind of, sort of. Okay, so <laughs> now let's do it so that when the user loads a page or something. So like if I have, if I make it so that on this page, um, in place of the login, I guess I could do it at the login, right? So if I go to, I'll just do it on page load just yep. for speed here. So when the page is loaded, I'm going to create a new thing and it's gonna be a login and the owner is going to be the current user and we'll set the date to current date and time, right? Yep. Then we're gonna make um, changes to a thing and the thing will be do a search for the login tally where the owner equals the current user. And we're gonna add results of step one to all four. Okay. And then we're gonna schedule two API workflows. So come down here, backend workflow. Login, login, login. This will be a login and this will be a login tally. Make changes to the tally. Last week, remove login. And this one, remove. Wait, so why are we removing them? But I'll show you. And then we're going to copy and paste and we'll call this one s30 and then this one so then back on our page i forgot which one it was Login, something with login. Anybody remember what I named it? Uh, User logs, there we go. 
So here we're going to schedule. We're going to remove last week, current date and time plus seven days. Login is one, two. So you're in the back end now, doing a back end workflow? Nope. I'm, I'm on the page at the moment. Wouldn't that run every time the page is loaded? Sorry, I didn't hear that, Jordan. Oh, wouldn't that run every time the page is loaded, though? Yes, it would. But but I'm I'm using this page as a login, right? Just for testing purposes. Wow. Yeah. Just, so so yes, it would. This would run every time the page is loaded. All right. So now I have it. So um, the last step here is I actually have to create a login tally for this user. So let me see here my users. All right, Tyus is the one I'll do. Login tally, new entry, owner. Tyosa. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Okay, so now the current user will have a, a tally to update. Right. And so I'll just run this page as that user. Okay. So now if I go to my database and I go to my tallies, I can see. Fifty more down the bottom. Well, that's crazy. You got it. There's fifty Let's more. Stop yeah. that. Let's go now. Log scheduler. Can't There's another that. fifty. It wasn't showing all the records. You didn't put a limit on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I did it on like I don't I'm not sure why that was going crazy, but here I only want to run it once, right? So we have to be careful not to do endless loop loop stuff, but. So, what generated that loop? I'm not sure. But you can see here, I just have the two scheduled to run. So on September 27th, which is seven days from now. Oh, I forgot on this workflow here. This one needs to be plus 30, not plus seven. But let's see here. So my tallies, let's refresh data here. I'm still Are confused. Doing, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, I'm still confused why you're removing. Right, I'm, I haven't gotten there, Reese. I'm oh. getting there. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> like the, the point, the, the reason is, is because they only stay in the bucket for the time that they're allotted, right? So, because when I do a search on this page here and I'm and use choose last seven days, if you don't remove it after seven days, then every view you look at will be all time. Yeah. Right? Because okay. it won't remove it. So what you're doing is when you create the login, you add it to all of the buckets, but then you schedule to remove it from the bucket at seven days or 30 days or gotcha. New Year's gotcha. Eve that way so that then you can switch the view and only view the number of logins for that bucket of time that you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. But make changes to login tally. Login tally first item. Oh, I know why. I have tallies here. I was not looking at login tallies. Wasn't wasn't the problem. I made a tally and not a login tally, maybe. There you go. So I only have one. So you can see I have this tally. I have all time last 30 last week and this year. And then in the logs, I have 
the schedule I have, um, it's set wrong because I had the seven days, I didn't update it to 30, but I have the two workflows scheduled to remove it from the bucket. So now as the owner of this, what I can do is I can search for logins where owner equals um, not logins. I don't want login. I want the login tally. Login tallies. And then if I want to see the number of logins, first we'll do current sales login tallies owners first last. Login tallies. Uh, let's see, I want to see in the last week the count. Right. And then I can have this as a conditional, right? Based on on which selection here, I want to show a different count. Right. So if I select here that I want to see last week, then I want to show the last week's count here. And then this one, you would have to also do it conditionally because your division would be based on how many, how much is in that bucket. But um, the average per day for a week would be this count here and then divided by seven. And now it should create a new one. See it changed because when I logged, when I loaded the page and showed this, I'm not sure why it's not showing my name, probably privacy rules. So number of logins, average login per day for the last week would be 0.28 because this is dividing two by seven. Now, what I'm, what I'm telling you, Reese, is that doing it this way is going to be a lot more efficient and a lot faster for you to load those reports on, like, if you had 1,500 users and you wanted to really, like, dig into the data, this is going to be a lot faster than just doing, like, coming in here and saying, okay, I want to do a search for uh, the current, like, basically, that would be would be like probably searching for users or something like that. So I'm showing you what not to do. So if you search for users and then you would do a search for um, logins, owner equals current sales user count. And you'd, you'd constrain it by the date, like say like uh, created date is greater than current date and time minus seven days. Right, so you could see the three logins of the current user that I am right now. But if you do a search on every single row, it's gonna start eating up all of your capacity. Does it make sense? Yep, okay. Can, <laughs> can Thank you, you run back over the how you did the removals with the APIs? Sure. So I created two different um, backend workflows one for removing last week. I'm sending in the login, which is a thing in the database and also the tally, which is a thing in the database. I'm sending one of each in as parameters. And then I make the changes to the tally last week and remove the login from that list. Because remember the last week is a list of logins, right? And then the I'm, same I'm thing- kind of, I'm kind of do copying you as you go along. <laughs> So go slow. Sure, I'll slow down. <laughs> I'll slow down. Yeah. So um, we're doing make changes to a mm -hmm. thing, and uh, and that's the login tally. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm actually a little bit confused as to why this would be any quicker because it's still searching the database for answers. So why why would this particular mm. way be quicker than the but other it's, one? It's one it's one search instead of however many rows you have searches. But if right? you do if you if you like with that repeating group, if you do a search for based off of that repeating group and you search for a user and each one of those users you get the data for their um uh, you don't but you're not getting the data per user so the way that i set it up originally i was showing you what not to do in the in the second example but in the in the first example what i was showing is that you're you're searching for login tallies which there's one tally per user and you've already put the data that you want to display into that thing called the tally, right? So when you do the search, you're just searching for the tallies and then displaying the data from that tally. You don't have to do any additional searches. Okay. Because when you refer to a thing, like the current cells tallies list of like that bucket, it's just counting the things that are in that list. It's not having to search for those things anew. Okay, all right. <laughs> Is it making sense or not? I know it's a little confusing. Like, it, it, no, no, it makes sense. Um, I just didn't think you'd have to go about it that way. I was just thinking, this is one of, yeah, this is, this is actually like one of the like quirks with using bubble, right? Like it's one of the use cases for using something like backendless because you can't create, um, there are a couple of reasons why. You, you can't create a field in bubble that's a formula, right? Yeah. And you can't, and you, and you also are not, there's not the flexibility to create what's a, what's called what would be a virtual view of the data. So like my only comparison that I know about and think I understand how it works to some extent, although I'm not an expert, would be back endless because that's what we've chosen to use in a different app. And the and the power of it is specifically that you can you can relate all of these different data types like here. So even in bubble, you could have an API call that references an app variable that represents a dis like that references a display so forth. So you can tie all of these together and you can cross reference and everything in bubble. That's not a problem. But what you can't do is you can't say, okay, I want to pull the field from the API call that's important to me. And then one from display and then one from match and put those all into a, I don't want to duplicate the data, right? I just mm -hmm. want to pull that data and then I want to query it and get only the information back that I want from that query. You can do that in back end list. You cannot do that in bubble. And then the other thing you can do in back end list that you can't do in bubble is you could set this, this uh, field as a formula and have it reference other fields, much like you can do in Airtable. So like if I'm in here, I'm looking at my rubric for grading books. All of these fields here that say FX are formulas. So they're taking on the same row, they're taking the different columns and doing math to them, right? And spitting out an answer. Uh, and Bubble gonna, doesn't let you do that. Sorry, I was gonna ask about Airtable. Is, there, is Airtable more efficient and can you link it into Bubble? <laughs> can you link it into Bubble? I would show you, but it's proprietary and it's got like people's names and emails in it. But right now I actually have a recursive workflow running uh, to add 10,000 10, records to an Airtable from Bubble. Right. So right. yeah, you can, you, you can get information um, from Airtable and send information into Airtable with Bubble. Okay. So, so it's not more efficient to maybe run the database from Airtable and then link it back over? Um, I wouldn't run the database from that. If I was going to use it in the way you're talking about for your use case, I would send the information into Airtable and then run my reports 
and do my analysis from Airtable itself. Okay. And that's very simple to set up. I can I could go over that. That's not a problem. The expense is Airtable cost um, in order to have access to their API. I think it's like $12 a month or something. Gets you 1,200 records. Um, $24 per month gets you 50,000 records per, per instance, per table, um, per or what they call a per base. So like you would have to upgrade um, yeah, you would, you'd have to, like, you could always make a copy of it, right? And then delete the data so that it keeps pouring in. So, but then your, all of your data is a little bit separated, but, <laughs> yeah, um, but it does, co it does cost it. money. It, it costs money to use Airtable is what I'm saying. So, yeah. 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 So to, <clears throat> excuse me, to migrate to Airtable or back endless is the, part of the matter that you export your bubble databases in CSV format and then upload them after setting them up? No, so I use um, to send the data into Airtable for analysis. I'm using the, um, the Airtable plugin by bubble. And in the case where I have the recursive workflow running right now to send 10,000 records into Airtable, I'm, I'm catching up, but I'm processing data that already exists, but I'm also planning on going back through and, um, and, and making the workflow so that it just creates the record on the fly as it's being created in the app. You could do it both ways creates the record in, on the fly in Airtable? In Airtable. So like I can set it up so that any any anything that I add to my database can create a new record in, in my Airtable. Or any update I make to my database could trigger a change in an update and a record in Airtable. If so I could keep it synced. Okay. If you were starting from scratch with a new project, would you use backend lists or Airtable? Or do you know the answer to that yet? It, it depends on the project and what I'm anticipating for the project. Um, for, for this, like if I was going to try to create a full front end for like this kind of rubric thing um, to go into and to be able to like see and interact and show other people this information, I would build the front end in bubble, but I'd probably build the back end and back end list. I probably would not choose to use Airtable for my database for my bubble app. Um, I think that Airtable is fantastic as its own interface. And I would send information into it to be able to analyze it and manipulate it and do what I want with it um, outside of Bubble. But I wouldn't try to keep pinging Airtable to get information back into Bubble. I, I only use it as one way to send from Bubble to Airtable. Okay. Um, if you're removing those uh, entries from the database using those backend workflows, uh, are they gone for good? Like, what if you want to analyze all of those? No, no, they're, they're, they're not gone. I'm just removing them from the list. I'm not deleting them. Oh. So the logins, the logins would all stay intact. It's just the login tally. It would no longer be in the last week list, and it wouldn't be in the last 30 list after seven and 30 days, respectively. What if, what if we make but it? But it would always stay in this year, or sorry, oh. in all time. Okay. What if we make it even easier and not analyze this stuff in bubble and just export it as a CSV and do it ourselves in Excel? You could do that. That's very simple. I don't know what the what the limitation is on exporting. I would have to feel that out because I have a feeling there's like there's a limitation at some point. I know there's limits on uploading, so maybe there aren't limits on exporting. Um, but I would definitely want to get a feel for whether or not that's going to be problematic. Uh, but if you're doing it on the regular, it wouldn't matter anyway. Because you would yeah. just go in there like once a week and export. 
Yeah, because I know I know my way around Excel pretty well. Um, I can do formulas and all that sort of stuff in it. So it wouldn't be hard for me to export it and then just do all the math. I think, stuff. I mean, if you just wanted to use something that was that was free and could kind of take whatever you throw at it, I might do it. I might I might create the workflows to send the data automatically into um, into Google Sheets or something like that. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yep. that is a good one. Can we look at the workflow for the removal again? I'm still behind you on that. Sure, no worries. So these are just the backend workflows and this yeah. is just triggering it. It's just gonna run once, which is it's gonna um, schedule to remove from the last week. So you make changes to the login tally. So this, this column here or the field last week, you remove that login that you were sending in the login here for the tally here. So you're making changes to the tally and you're removing the login from the last week field. And then the same, but for the 30 day field. And then are you clear on these two? No, I'm not clear on the parameters of the API workflow. Well, there's two things in the database. There's yeah. the login. When you log in, you create a new one. And then there's a login tally that only ever one gets created per user. Yeah. Right. So yeah. from here, we're sending in the login that we created that we're sending into as a parameter and also the tally belonging to the current user. behind you so when you say send well the piece that you're that? missing is it so so jay the piece that you're missing is is this doesn't show you how i scheduled it but i have to go to the other page so i want to make sure that you're clear on like what's happening is this workflow is receiving these parameters and then running this simple change are you clear on that part no i'm where are the parameters going that's what you're about to go to where that you mean where they're coming from they're going here this is where they're go going okay right yeah and then, i know where they're coming from i understand the data types and i'm with you that far okay so from the user logs here is where we're scheduling them yes okay and sorry it's quit on me i don't know if it's going to come up or not bubble hates it when you switch <laughs> it's like it's already Monday. It's I don't want to do this. <laughs> I don't want to work. Don't make me work. Okay. So you scheduled the remove from last week from seven days from now, because we create the login and now we have to, and we make changes to the login tally. We add the same login to all four buckets. Then now we need to schedule in seven days to remove it from the um, from the seven day bucket, and we're going to send in the login that we just made in step one, and we're going to send in the tally that belongs to um, the current user. So results of step one and results of step two, respectively, and then the same thing for the last 30, except we're gonna send it 30, we're gonna schedule it for 30 days from the current date. So, okay, the results of step, make sure, what result to step, uh, step one? So you're creating a new, user activity or new uh, new login on this page, but shouldn't that get created on the sign-in page? Yes, I, I, sorry, you missed that. I, okay. I'm i doing this just because it's easier to put it right here, right? But you would put this in the workflow where you're logging users in. I'm just using Canvas, so it's harder for me to find exactly where to create it. So I just put it as a, as as a page load instead of when the user actually logs in. So if you go back to step three uh, and look at those parameters, then would that be a do a search for? Because otherwise it's not accessible. 
no, I don't need to search for anything because I created the login here. So the result of step one is the login that I want to send in. But and in real life, would you not have that create a new login here? You'd have it when they logged in. Like you're just doing this to show us, right? Yeah, but the but the login is a thing in the database, right? Yeah. So I'm create I'm creating a thing in the database called a login, right? And I create it wherever I have this workflow, whether it's like this is when they after they log in or whatever, and I can trigger a custom event. I'm going to create a new login every time they log into the platform or the app. And then this will always, this would be the result of step one is easier than doing a search for. Because I, I can just, I can just refer to it. The login mm -hmm. that I want to send in is result of step one. And then the tally here, I did a search for it. Here's where I did the search for the login tally that belongs to the current user. And so here, the results of step two is this login tally that I searched for here. There are times when you will make changes to something and not actually change anything simply for the purpose of being able to grab it later on in the workflows actions. Did you do and but you did something in the back. I'm sorry, I feel so obtuse. Okay. But you, so you built the schedule and API workflow in the back end. Okay. So I'm with you that far. I did that, although I'm getting an error on the remove. Um, but I still, I'm sorry, I still don't understand. Like if the user has logged in, you know, on the login page, but you're the only one using the user log page, then what login would you be creating? It doesn't make sense to me. Okay. So I did this purely for example purposes, but if right. I had done this, I would have gone to, I'd have to find up like, right. The, so I did that. Sign up login, right? Created so wherever login. you're logging in. Yeah. Okay. So wherever you have them logging in, then you're going to schedule and probably you would schedule it as a, as a custom event rather than just adding four more steps to your login process. But however you're doing it, you're creating a new login, which is a thing in the database, right? So right. because that didn't exist before, we didn't we didn't have something to create in the database to track the login, right? So you create the login after they log in. You're going to create a new one every time they log in. Yes, I have. I put that in my sign-in workflow. So this whole flow should be could be living in the sign up. Or the login workflow should be sign. living in the sign up, should right? Okay. I just put it on this page because I happen to be using this page. Gotcha. Already. All right. I'm sorry. It took me so it's long a... to catch up with that. I understood this was an example, but I didn't understand that. I thought only the first two parts belonged in sign up, and I thought the schedule API stuff belonged elsewhere. But now I understand that all belongs together. Okay. Yep. It all has to go together because you want to do it. Um, you want to schedule the seven days and the 30 days based on the current date and time when you create the new login. I think, uh, I think for me, uh, I'm just going to do simple calculations on the front end uh, that can display in like an admin panel or so, something like that. But for the deeper data um, and the comparisons and just cumulative data, I'll just do it all myself. Uh, yeah, so the simple, if you're if you're not gonna look at it all like for like the just one user at a time, like then you're probably comparing the user's last login. Like you would have a date field and you would just keep track of the last day that they logged in. I think Canvas actually does that. So for the user, well, you just capture every time they log in, right? And then you can just compare that in Excel when you pull the data out. Right. What I'm saying is for your simple, like if, if you're keeping things simple, so you don't have to do the whole tally thing that I'm talking about, oh. then you would just keep track of like the last login, last active date here. And then you could just do a list of users and you could, you could say like, you could sort them by who was logged in the most recently. Yep. Good. 
Oh, Jordan must have had to leave. Hmm. I'll check in with him and see if he had a question. Kim, you want to send him a message for me? Yeah. Sure. And we did have another question was how to, this one was coming from Paul Salvage and he was asking how to create a video chat link that didn't depend on him to get it started. So like he has a marketplace where he's putting advisors in touch with advisees and wants to be able to connect them using video chat. And he's, you know, looking at um, Agora and maybe Twilio for it. And I told him I would show him how I would use Jitsi for it instead, because Jitsi is free and it's super, super simple. So. This is interesting. So I guess the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a repeating group of users. And then I think I'll constrain it where the user is not me. So where unique ID does not equal current users unique ID. And then we'll put a text here with the username. I'm gonna go with the email because I think I don't I don't have usernames um, the names stored properly right now. So there we go. Then not just a button to start chat. Okay. Right, and then on this workflow, it's very, very simple. I'm going to open an external website and I'm gonna grab the link here from Jitsi itself or the, the first part of the link, I should say. So I just wanted to make sure. So this is the first part of the link. It's amazing what's free these days. And then we're going to say, uh, probably what I'll do is I'll do current cell users. <laughs> do first and then I'll do current cell users and I don't want to space so I'll double definitely make sure like unique ID there we go because the thing is you want to make sure that the link that you're sending into Jitsi is um is unique. And so this is how you could do that, like using the unique ID with the first name or something else you could do is the first, and then you could do like the current date and time, but as a time like stamp. So you could do current date and time. Do you know if it's possible to iframe Jitsi? Um, I haven't, I haven't played around with that. You can play around with that. I encourage you to do that. Um, like you could do first and then you could go and add another here, current date and time.
maybe that no, that probably wouldn't work because it's got all sorts of things. But however you want to make it unique, right? And then so probably the current user's unique ID is the easiest way to do it. Right. So however you make it unique. So you open that and then here it's really easy. You'll send an email. Send an email to current cells users email and send them that link, the same link here, right? So you can copy all. To make this like proper video calling rather than like a Zoom where you send them an email link, could you save that to a, I guess if you've got a conversation data type and you had like video call pending or something, could you send the link to that? And when yep, that- And you could make that link unique to that thing. Yeah, you. I mean, there are a million different ways that you could do this. So I'm just thinking like the simplest way, like if you had, if you have them chatting already and the way that I initially did this was I had like a start video call button at the top of the chat. So I created whatever the unique link was and then I sent it to the other person in the chat in the same click. And then when they clicked on that link, it just opens up in Jitsi and you go to it. So, and I don't want the current, I want the current users first. It'd be interesting to see if it works in a wrapped app because that's one of the things I came up against with one of the other ones is that it works if you use it on a PC or anything like that. But as soon as you try and do it in a wrapped app, I don't know what no, it is. No, that's a whole, that's, that's a whole, like, it would be interesting to hire real developers to get the RTC right for a wrapped app mm. for that, because it, it can be done, right? Because you have apps clearly that do it, but like I couldn't figure that out for the wrapped app um, with BDK last year either. Like I spent oh, a couple it. days trying to work it out. What? Oh, you tried it. So I didn't realize you tried it with a wrapped app. Yep, I did. So last Last year when I was working on Hey You, um, that was one of the one of the things and I could get it working. I didn't use Jitsi for that. I used, I think, Twilio or something like that. But I, I contacted Gaurav and I was like, hey, how can I get video chat to work? And he was like, you can't really. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> thanks. You can't is, is basically the answer. Or, or without hiring a developer to do something crazy difficult, there is no way to do it. That's basically what he said. He said that there was um, the the issue was you could you could send them to the browser outside of the wrapped app. You could send them back to the browser, but the problem then was they weren't weren't going to be logged into the app, so it couldn't be like a protected chat or whatever. But to me, creating a unique link for Jitsi is kind of like creating a password. Right, like somebody has to know when you're actually on that link and the password is the link in order to interrupt you. Could it happen if you're using the same simple link over and over? But yeah, but if you're using like, if I use a combination of my current user's um, unique ID and the, and the current date and time, current oh, date and time, the, the BDK native um, one where it allows you to open a, a an external web page, but within the BDK native app. So it is going to an external web page, but it doesn't show the URL along the top. Um, and that's what I've used for like loading news articles. I wonder if that would work because technically you're- Well, and there are, I haven't played around. I haven't done anything with the plugins that exist for Jitsi. So you could play around with that. Maybe a plugin author has already figured out how to iframe it in or some other way of bringing it in. Um, I didn't play around with that. I was told specifically this would, you know, keep it as simple as possible. And um, yeah, I'm okay, go. yeah, so essentially if I go into my user here, uh, my app data and I create a new user, See if I could do this. Yeah, and my email. Okay. 
um, what's the day, 20th? It'll be true in a minute. <laughs> Let's see, we'll make the 19th. Ah, I hate this part of the bubble. Okay, and then full standard inactive no email three. Name. Any of that. Okay, I think that will suffice. So if I run this Jitsi page as this user, I start the video chat. So it's made this using my unique ID for the Jitsi thing. So I can join the meeting. And now I'm in the meeting. Um, the problem was something went wrong here because I did the search for users where unique ID is not current ID. So I'm going to preview this again. So I'm going to start video chat. I can put my name in as Tyosa. So now I'm in here, and then I can come in with my phone. I should have gotten an email. I did not. But someone else can come to this link and we can show how it works. So, or you can all come to this link and see how it works. Hi, Elon. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so you can see that it's very simple. There's no, they don't have to download anything to make it work. They don't have to do anything uh, special. You just create the link and then you have this like full screen experience. And I can, I can open up my laptop camera here. Let's see here. Oh yeah, now everybody is like, you can see my hand, right? So, and that's Jitsi, that's Jitsi in a nutshell. It's very, very simple. And um, unless you need to do some fancy tracking of like what's happening in the meetings where you need recordings or, or you need to prove that the meeting actually existed and happened in order to charge for it, then yeah, it should work. He's having so much fun. <laughs> All right, Callum, we can't hear you. <laughs> All right. Yep. So that's Jitsi. Super, super simple. Cool. And I and I think it works for the majority of use cases. Like it's not an in-app experience, but it does what you need it to do in, in terms of like getting people connected. And so, Kim, to answer your question, the keyword here for Paul Salvage's question is um, video chat, easy video chat within Bubble, user to user chat, something like that. Yeah, this is good to know. Yeah. Hey, Jordan, welcome back. Hi, how are you? Good. Did you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, I just wanted to get my head around like the conditionals on um, buttons and stuff. Okay. You want me to stop sharing so you can share? 
Yes, please. Um, can you make sure that your screen is pretty, it's like on the smaller one? Yep. The reason I ask this is when you use your larger one on, when we go to share it on YouTube, it makes the whole thing smaller. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me know when you're ready. Yep. Your screen smaller one, screen one, sweet. Perfect. Um, so just with the hang on, wait. Go to the header. Not the header, the so I have this pop up. And and then I've got this um, button disable, and it says uh, when pop up applications type is um, sorry, this one here when pop up. New applications type is group, uh, group main new profiles text and input first name contact value is empty or phone number contact value is empty, then this element is applicable. But when I when I run it um, and all of those things match, it still um, isn't applicable. So if I hang on. Sure. Well, right now, that's the way that you want it. If all of those things match. Oh, so when I put there, so new. So I go new lead, new profile. So when I put a name in here and a number in here, this should be clickable, but it's not. Okay, so what's this? What's the, um? go back to the conditional. What's what's the pop up new applications type is group main new profiles text? What is that? So I'm setting this. I'm sending this um, this text here. So new profile. Setting this to a state. So when I click that button, it sets a state and this uh, setting a type and the the group's text. Okay. Um. Because this has got a text. Um, type of content is text and it's new profile. So that's setting the text saying new profile. Okay. Which, which is then showing, uh, making this visible. And then I want when that's new profile, that's not empty and that's, or, so I, I want these two things to be mandatory basically. And I want these two to be optional. Okay. Um, but it's not working and I'm pretty sure I've got it set up correctly. So I think by default, you want the button to be not clickable. Yeah. And then. Um, so go over here. Yeah. So from the from the button itself, you would just say this this element isn't clickable. There's no option for that. There is. And. I see it right there. This element oh, isn't clickable. Oh, okay. yeah. And then yeah. in the conditional, what you want to do is when pop up new, so you have the and right and input first name. And yep. instead of instead of or, you want to make that and or where it says or phone number contacts value is empty. That's I want to say and, uh huh. And then uncheck the this element is unclickable and see if that made a difference. Does it matter about which order they're in? No, not if they're all and or or right. I don't think so. And like so if it's and or or um like say if you've got like 10, 10 ors and one and, how does it know which ones to group together kind of thing? The or is the optional one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if the end at the start or the end at the end? No. Right. No, it's going to. Um... Yeah, see, now I've made there and it. See, it shouldn't be clickable now.
So, so I mean, different. is it is it true? Like, so what I'm trying to understand, I guess, is is the pop up new applications type part of it important? What makes the what makes that state so important? So, because um, if I hit, hit this state, it gives a, a profile. So you select the name. So in this oh, state, got it. Okay. I need this state in this box to make this clickable. And I need this state and these two boxes to make that one clickable. I would probably, I. You don't need the first part then because they can't even see it. If that state, unless that state is present. Well, but they it's, can't the, same, even it's the same part. button for both same button. is what yeah. he's saying. Oh, it's the same button. Oops, yeah. sorry. Yeah. I guess I could put in a different button there. You could do that, but I think that's probably where the issue is coming is from that okay. state is is nailing that expression for the state. Uh, pop up applications group type is new profile text and input is not empty. And so that sh should be it now. Eh? Let's try that. Oh, yeah, so that's worked. Okay, cool. Okay. So now I'll just need to go back and make uh, this one work. So that one can go. Pop up new application type is existing and drop down value is. Is not empty. Yeah. Not empty. Okay, cool. So is that the yeah. best way to do it is to always make it sort of not clickable? Start yeah, because I mean, because it, you want it to become clickable when the condition happens. So it should default to being not clickable. So whatever your default state that you want it to be should be yeah. how it is. And your default in this case would be you don't want it clickable until they meet certain requirements. Okay, so if I go back and then change, oh, you can't. Okay, so if I go back and change that, oh yeah. Cool, and then I just set up a condition to make it clickable then there. Yep. So once it's run, how come it goes back to being not clickable there? Uh, why you're showing something different? Is that a different <laughs> button? It's the same button. Oh, that, that must be that one, okay. No, oh, because you have the fact that this element isn't clickable. Yeah. No, but that's, which this one here, you mean? No, no, like which, which one is when, the one that's not clickable right now. Yeah. Go back to the page, whatever state that is, I don't know which condition it is like that you're trying to target. So when it says new lead at the top. Yeah. Yeah, I see that's this one here, progress bar number. So you have it, if it meets all of those conditions, you have it set so that the button won't be clickable, that's why. Yeah. So you know, after I make it clickable on this one, will it stay clickable? Or will I, do I have to reset it or something or how do I? I'm not, Can I not like, so, uh, I, I don't know, like you have different things happening on that button click, right? Yeah, it does like three different things every time you, you click it. So I guess my question in the workflow, can I um, make it when I do click it each time it disables it again? Well, the only thing that's going to have it be enabled is if it's matching one of those um, conditions to be enabled, right? Yeah. So like when you, when you change the, um, when you change it to the new lead thing or whatever, then that state changes, right? So if the state changes, then it's gonna be defaulted not to clickable until yeah. you meet the conditions again. Oh, and you okay. don't have to meet the same conditions, you have to meet a different set of conditions, right? Yeah, okay, sweet. Yeah, I got it. Oh, good. Cool. Yep. Yeah, and for the one that last 
that last condition we were talking about is yeah. right now you have to have it they have to be empty like yeah. at least one has to be empty in order for it to be clickable but or or to be not clickable you would just change it so you'd flip it around so the number like change these to the end yeah. is not empty and then uncheck this element is isn't clickable so is not empty to do and then like that mm -hmm. so see if I take the number away then it's So I don't. Yeah, it's not disabled to start with. Hmm. Well, right there, you're saying if, if the drop down source value is not empty, up empty. So the order of your conditions does matter, by the way. It does. It does. So you would, you have to pay attention to um, the order because it will look for them in order. So if you have something that negates something else be below it, it will run that thing last. So it should be order in, in, in the way that the pages. So the first one that we're doing should be at the top. Is that right? Mm -hmm. No, so like I, it, if it finds any condition at this point that is going to make it um, clickable, mm -hmm. then it will then it will make it clickable. And I don't understand what the progress bar number one's number is thirty three and sixty six. I don't understand what that means exactly. So every time you pu push this button, it sends um, a number to this progress bar thirty three. Okay. Uh, yeah. So are you change so so and so this should be these should all be and I think okay. not or okay So basically, when I push next, it, pu it pushes a number 33 to the progress bar. Okay. So at the moment, it's on 33. I select a new profile, fill that in, push that, it'll make it 66, which will take it to this screen, into that, and then boom. Oh, yeah, that's done it. But yeah, if I go back and that number is gone, it shouldn't be clickable, eh? No. Why is what's going on? Oh, is it because it's a, oh, that's probably why. Hmm. I'm not sure why that's happening. Maybe it's because it's the um not the normal input, eh? Got it. Well, it's still, but you're changing the value of it when you. So put a number in there that makes it clickable. If I take that number out, it's 
still clickable. So you can still run a, a check on that. Um, maybe what you do is set number that's entered there for the mobile into a state and then run the condition on the state instead. If it, if for some reason you can't get bubble to read that input exactly. Well, could I set See, up I a, don't know if, another condition just for that one? Or? I mean, that's kind of hacky. So I would kind of play around with it or maybe even, is that done through a plugin? Yeah, that's a plugin, yeah. Like I might even check with the with the plugin owner or something, but there's um it's a pretty good plugin for anyone that um wants to use phone numbers because it turns it into a um into an international format number. Yep. When you save it, so that it takes out all the spaces, adds in plus whatever the country code is, and it saves mm -hmm. them uniquely so that you can call on them later. That's mm. awesome. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. I'll, I'll, that'll keep me going anyway. So thank you very much. You're welcome, of course. All right. I've got about five minutes left. Does anybody have any other questions? I have uh, two minor questions. What's up? Uh, first one being, you, you, uh, the other day I mentioned to you that uh, about the pricing of uh, the bubble plans. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned the event scheduling i didn't i didn't really understand what you meant by that can you clarify sure so event scheduling has to do with the very specific um workflow in the back end called recurring events so you can um schedule recurring events on any paid plan because you can do the back end workflows on any paid plan mm -hmm. but what they do is they limit you to only running recurring events monthly, not any or like sooner than monthly on the personal plan. If you want to unlock um, more recurring events per like workflow or more or more frequent recurring events than monthly, you have to upgrade to the professional plan instead. So, you don't actually schedule the frequency of a recurring event. This is where it gets really confusing. You don't schedule the frequency of a recurring event from the back end. So testing recurring. So the type of thing would be like, um, we'll just use our tally, log and tally here. Um, and then I would schedule this from oh, workflow here, I could schedule a recurring event. So set cancel a recurring event. Yep. This is where you select the frequency. Uh, okay. I'm on an agency plan. So it won't let me, I, it'll probably let me do anything. But if I was on a personal plan and I selected weekly, I would say your current plan doesn't allow you to do that. So apparently yep. on the agency plan, I can I can schedule up to five recurring things per thing in my database. Um, and I can probably do daily and it's fine. But if I was on a personal plan, it would tell me, oh, you can't do that upgrade if you want to use daily or weekly. Yeah, you said we could, there's a workaround with that anyway by just using rec yep. um... recursive workflows. So yeah. if you want to do a recursive workflow, they do not at this time require you to be on a professional plan. So um, you can just do, like if I wanted to do this, I'd do a new API and cursive recurring. And all I have to do to get it to run again is I would just schedule it to run a schedule the same yeah. workflow. <laughs> Current date and time. And then uh, this would do a loop. It would just keep going and going and going and going. Yeah, <laughs> so you have to fine. tell it when to stop. But yeah, you can you can schedule workflows to run again at the end. It's kind of weird that they wouldn't have, you know, uh, covered that up a bit if they. I call it I call it an ignorance tax. Yeah. 
<laughs> so you could use this for the remove tally that we were doing before and just once a month clean up that user's tallies. Uh, so I did that when I was creating the tally structure. I oh, did that. I scheduled on New Year's Eve of every every year, once a year, I scheduled a recursive workflow rather than making an annual recurring workflow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and lastly, uh, this is regarding users. How can you effectively ban users? And if they attempt to log in, you know, it gives them a message that they're banned and they need to contact support or something. Yep. So on your login, you would check so the way that we do it in, um, in Canvas is each user has an inactive yes or no. And if it's yes, then we don't let them do anything else. Like we just prevent them from logging in and you can set up whatever workflow you want to email them or show them a pop-up or something that prevents them from going in anywhere else. You wouldn't delete them, right? Because then they could just sign up again. But yeah. this effectively, like, like this mechanism means that this email address can't log into the app, right? Because <clears throat> the thing that's unique about users is their, is their email address. So it doesn't prevent them from signing up with new email. You capture their IP address. And we'll create an IP address blacklist. You could. Yep, you could do that as well. Okay. All right, thank you. You're <laughs> welcome. Help. Yeah, no worries. All right, I've got to get going. So I'm going to wrap up office hours for now, but I, we will be back tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pacific time for any, but oh, hi, Benji. There he is, special guest star. He's so cute. I hope we haven't got any work done today. He's been stuck yeah. on <laughs> Got Sorry, this. I'll let you finish up. <laughs> no worries. So we'll be back. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pacific time. If you would like to join us for a complimentary session of office hours, please go ahead and email us at team at co-creative no code.com and we'll get back to you with credentials so you can join us tomorrow or for whichever session you would like. And yeah, you can see what it's all about. Thank you so much, uh, Jordan Callum, Jay Reese, Thomas and Kim for being here today. I always love seeing you and I hope to see you again tomorrow. Thank well, you so much. You. That was a particularly meaty session. Yeah, yeah it was, it was good. <laughs> save, save this one on Facebook. Yep, definitely. It's, a, it's, on, it's on Facebook and it's going on YouTube, so. Awesome. Have All a right. great afternoon, talk to you soon. Thanks, bye, bye everybody. Bye. bye. bye.